Good morning, Shola. Today is May 26th, 2018. <laughs> I'm laughing because I had to start over because I said it was 1918. <laughs> oh, God. Well, when you hear the night I've had, you will understand. Anyway, I wanted to do this early in the morning because I didn't want to forget any of it. I probably will have forgotten some, but I'm going to do my best and to keep it as short as possible. Okay, so here goes. As many of you know, I have trouble sleeping. And um, so last night was no exception. I was awake about three hours, but then, then um, I started going into an askia and I wasn't doing it consciously. I mean, it just was happening. First, I didn't even realize what it was because it wasn't like the whole procedure, you know, but I could feel the, the energy of the, the shorter version happening. And I went through the portal, so to speak. And I was in, um, or seeing from above rather, um, the large Kiva at Chaco Canyon. And I was not seeing it as a ruin. ruin. I was seeing it as a whole structure. It was very sketchy. I didn't see great detail, but I saw it more or less as a covered structure. Um, and I wasn't sure. At times it was covered and other times it was open. You know, this is the way I was perceiving it. Because at times I needed to see inside it. So it was open and other times it was closed. And I had the feeling that at various stages in time, it had been covered and then left open for purposes. So it was almost as if the cover to it could be taken off. I know it sounds kind of strange for back then, but it almost seemed like they could do that in some way. I don't know if that was true. I'm just giving you my impressions. So sometimes I saw it covered. And sometimes I saw it open during this experience. So I saw this and then I saw it open and I saw all of us standing in a circle around the askia. So the askia would have been inside it with the threads, you know, connecting uh, to the, um, the central hub that was, you know, pulsing and open and like a, a moving stargate, so to speak. Then I saw and felt the golden disc at the sand dunes and above it in the chamber of Mount Blanca that's under the dunes, I felt and saw the true dweller skull of Perquanthus John Martinus that we're calling Templar right now, although I think that name is going to change for, because the vibration of the skull is changing fast. I don't know what's happening to it. It's different from all of the rest in that sense. But anyway, I saw that real skull and it was inside, or, or not inside, I'm sorry. Well, it was inside the cavern, but it seemed to be hover, it, in my vision, understand. It was hovering above that round table that had been brought or transported from um, the great underneath the Great Pyramid that I saw so many years ago. It's the more or less child duplicate of the one at Ruta. And I saw that table underneath it. So in the vision, I'm not saying it was physically that, that it's physically that way, but in the vision I saw the skull hovering above the table, the table hovering above the solar disk. And the solar disk, for the first time, I saw it a little clearer than I've ever seen it. I'm not saying perfectly clear, but clearer. And I realized that it was a, an alchemical gold, but it was an alchemical gold and crystal. So it was some kind of hybrid between the two, you know, between a, the alchemical gold and a crystal. And it was a sort of a shield-like almost like a big spaceship, you know, starship uh, looked like that. And actually, it probably was. In a sense, I was starting to feel that this disc was a starship. Maybe not, you know, 
like we would see flying around in the sky, but it had some some uh, Merkabic properties. So that was what I saw. Remember, I saw Chaco Canyon, the 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 um, Kiva there, the Grand Kiva, and then I saw this other. Then I saw. I felt this energy. Now, while this is going on, I had my Alexa playing for me, um, Liquid Mind, the, a shuffle of different songs from Liquid Mind, which all basically sound pretty much the same, but it's very soothing. And I, oh my God, Alexa's talking to me now because I mentioned her name. Uh, so, <laughs> just a minute, I got to stop it now. Alexa, stop. Anyway, she's here and she's there, she's everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I was letting her play those songs for me by, by Liquid Mind. And it's very soothing, but it's very similar. And it was just going on. And so it became part of the experience. It was the perfect music for it. So as this was playing, as this was playing, uh, the music was kind of setting the tone. And I felt the Kiva literally merge with the sand dunes disc thing you know it was like it was all coming together the kiva was literally being transported not really of course but you know an energetic aspect of it was sort of temporarily just uh not being moved permanently but just temporarily the the, the uh, etheric energy of it was being merged with the the whole setup here the sand dunes well then and I, I'm going fast here because things happened, you know, and it was worked for a while and then something else. It didn't go this fast, but I'm talking fast. So then I, I um, noticed that I was seeing again myself in the, the, um, the labyrinth at I Am Harmony, which is uh, Kiara's. And um, I remember, if you'll recall, probably some of you wouldn't because you weren't with us then, but I, when I started this whole thing about my journey here to Crestone from, from Kauai, the thing that started me off was seeing me standing inside that labyrinth in Crestone when I was back in Kauai at night, you know, I was doing the Ischia and all of a sudden, boom, there I was in Crestone in the labyrinth, which was a huge surprise for me at the time. Well, I was there again last night. I was there in the labyrinth. And um, I felt energies of that labyrinth working with the the combining energies of the setup of, you know, Mount Waka, Sand Dunes, Disc, all of that with the Kiva. Then the point on the land that we used to own, Simeon and I, um, at Kel we called it Kalandara. And I have not been back to that point since I've been here. I don't even know if I could access it legally because, of course, it's owned by, I think, the Hindu monastery or something, but we had a stone circle that we created there with the pole that Raymond built for us and put in the center. And uh, so I saw it again because it's right on what Thoth calls the blue fire meridian line coming off the mountains, coming off the mountain where the sacred on is. So I saw that lit up, so to speak, the energy wise. Now, all of this was being subtly directed by the sacred on it wasn't prominent in the experience but in the background i knew it was the orchestrator or it was being used as the tool of the orchestrator so we had the labyrinth of kiaras the um the blue fire meridian point on the former land kalandara um and of course all the things at the sand dunes going on with the kiva I'm trying to get to keep you track here of what what's going on um, so then let me think what happened next. Oh, okay. So this all sort of just grew in energy. And then I was suddenly back at the Kiva and we were all in there. And there, I realized that there was this octahedron crystal. Now, this was a real crystal crystal underneath the Grand Kiva. Now, again, this crystal, you couldn't get a shovel and dig it up. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's 
it's slightly interdimensionally removed, but it is there in the holographic field of this planet. That crystal is underneath that kiva. At least this is my interpretation of what I experienced. And it was I, I got a name for it, and it was Tsar, spelled just like the Tsars of Russia. T S. How do you spell the Tsars? T T Z A R. Yeah, <laughs> T Z A R. Tsar. And um. It was the czar crystal, and I could literally feel the vibration. It was like the word czar, you know, it was like it was a it was a vibration of the whole thing. Well, then something really surprising happened. I saw Katrina, Jennifer, and Andrea and I standing around this crystal in the center of the circle with all of you, the rest of you, around that. And the crystal had literally lifted up, sort of, you know, and was sitting among us. Well, I believe the crystal is actually the size of the key, but more or less. But in the vision, to accommodate this vision, the crystal had to fit inside the key. So, and, and, and we had to be, you guys had to be circled around it. But I was recognizing that this was an accommodation for my vision so I could understand the dynamics, even though the crystal was actually a little larger. So I immediately questioned, why are the four of us around it? And this is where it really got interesting. So I'm going to just pause the vision a moment to share with the Shalar who don't know this, what's going on. Now, um, I did mention that, uh, you know, uh, Katrina and Jennifer and Andrea were brought into the Shalar via Thothic invitation. Um, and they are with me. They've invited me to become part of their teaching circle. I'm going to call it that right now uh, with people they are working with and have been working with, as I understand it, for over six months now. And um, so they are all working under the energy field of the sacred on, on <laughs> sacred on, <laughs> sacred on in some way. This is what Katrina told me and she was feeling it. And I immediately felt it as well and received an affirmation from Thoth that that was true. So all of a sudden, you know, I, and I'd also felt, let me go back a little further, I'd also felt and been literally shown by Thoth or felt by Thoth that the Sholar were very strongly connected to what was going on there, not participating like, you know, in the school, in the circle, teaching people, but as a as a as an energy field that we had we had developed for all of these several years now what has it been three years or something like that and even though it seems like we're doing nothing in a way Thoth assures me that we're doing a lot and it's in the inner and uh, mostly and so this field has been developing well Katrina and her ladies have been developing their field and now the two are resonating. They're not amalgamating, but they're resonating in a very, like almost twinning fashion. One is feeding the other, both directions. Now, so um, I'm going to put that aside for a moment and go back to the scene. So as as the teachers, we could, I had don't have another word to call us, we're standing around the crystal um, with all of you around us. I was being shown or felt that um, what Katrina and these ladies are doing, and now I've become a part of it, while it has great value, great value in teaching the teachers, <coughs> it has, because that's basically the format of it, there's an underlying current, and that current is directly working through the arc, uh, the, the on. And at that moment, I was shown the czar crystal. And it's like little parts of it, not parts of it, but little seeds came out of it like shining orbs. And they went into each one of the teachers around the crystal. And then they went into all of you, each one of you in the Sholar, everyone. And the czar crystal was feeding us. It was saying, you have part of me now. Then I realized also <clears throat> that this 
teaching circle that I'm calling for now was intending now in this stage that it's in now receiving this arc transmission this on transmission of the, the seeded crystals and as student teachers were brought through the progression and fed the energy that we as the teachers are feeding them many of them not all perhaps or maybe all you know it's like a a, a choice thing so i can't say absolutely all all or many will receive this field this crystalline field that's coming out of the sacred on but going through this whole process and using the czar crystal that's been waiting to work with it to bring this reciprocity about now there are vast missing pieces of this at this point i you know for me i can't give you a whole story i'm just telling you what i experienced last night and what i received out of that experience and how i'm interpreting it in this moment so these things can change not drastically but you know pieces fit or i understand more of it and i go oh i see now and these things can start working and falling into place not just me perhaps many of you will start seeing things and feeling things and and communicating let's communicate about it and see what falls into place and so i also had this sense Katrina, that you had um, been carrying something of this czar crystal within you because it seemed like the crystal came right up in front of you. I saw you and the crystal coming up in front of you, and that's when that crystal was introduced to me. So you had some particular action in that regard oh, oh my goodness i knew that was going to happen i'm so sorry i know all of you just jumped right out of your skin that was my cat fell off the table let me take care of it and i'll get right back to you i'm really sorry i can't cut that out it would take a lot of doing to take this into the program cut it out and then re-render it all you know i'm just gonna leave it so i hope that it didn't scare you too much <laughs> oh gosh Nirvana was poised on the little shaky table and just landed in the in the trash pail. <laughs> oh. Okay, so back to the story, if I can do that now. I think it's about concluded. Let me just catch up here. It was like so much more was ready to present itself. Oh, oh yes. Okay, this is the the finale here um so then i was i was well i was also feeling that the crystals skulls on this altar here in my home you know the, these dweller skulls and i mean they were just talking back and forth i mean active i could just feel the energies of them but it was not hectic it was uh oh this cat is driving me crazy some stuff up here um it was like very purposeful it was a purposeful energy and i'm sorry okay let's see if i can get back to it now so it was so purposeful and and it, it was like it had been waiting to happen but there was transformation trans transferring of codes like between the skulls and the periquanthus John Martinus skull, um, it was just the one that was the most active. But then all of a sudden, little, um, the littlest one I have, you know, hosting wise, is the uh, Osiris, which is kind of interesting because Osiris is the big boy in the whole process, Osiris rising, right? But it's always been the smallest little skull, and it doesn't do much but just twinkle. And I never really, you know, the other ones are, well, not all of them, but the the, uh, the Periquanthus, of course, and, of course, uh, the White Queen, and um, uh, the Horus 
bearer, which is sort of an overall energy system skull, and the um, the guardian skull, the old one, you know, of uh, Holos. Those are the ones that seem to be the rock stars. <laughs> and the, the others, they're sitting there kind of, huh, okay, you know, we're just kind of backing up, which I could understand for the others except for um, – Osiris and Isis, they should be very active, and they've always just been kind of quiet, sitting there, sparkling, and that's been about it. Well, all of a sudden, little Osiris started waking up, and I was really feeling this. Now I'm lying in my bed, and they're in the living room, but I'm just feeling this going on. And Paraquanthus is the one that's activating it somehow, uh, although the queen is like holding her energy field really strong, you know, while Paraquanthus is working this out. So... I can't tend to want to call the skull Paraquanthus right now, so that's what I'm going to do. Anyway, um, so little Osiris was coming alive. And then I was told to get up out of my bed, go get little Osiris and bring him in to bed with me. <laughs> so I really didn't want to do that because the cats were finally calm. They were going ballistic during this whole thing. And I was holding the stream, but, you know, in the background, the cats were doing things. And they'd gotten all quiet around me, and I did not want to disturb them, but I had to get up to it. So very quickly got the skull, came back. Fortunately, they were still fine. And I just said, okay, now what? You know, and this has been going on for hours and all this stuff. I'm not sleeping, but I don't seem to be too upset about it. And I felt I was shown, and I'm going to show you the picture because I took a picture this morning. Okay, so here's Osiris. Isn't he beautiful? But he's very small but compared to the rest of the ones that I have. But he's quite impressive. And I just took this picture this morning. And I want to show you the other one. Now, here's the way I'm, I want to show you what I was told to do. This was how I was instructed to hold him last night in bed <laughs> with my two fingers. You can't see the other side of my hand, but both my fingers are in an eye socket. So two eye sockets are filled with my fingers. And then, you know, the thumb on one side and the, the fingers on the other to hold it steady, almost like a key that I would put into a lock. So that's the way I was told to hold the skull. And I couldn't have done this with a larger skull. I always wondered why did... They, you know, why did Thoth approve such a tiny little skull for Osiris, you know, the smallest in the bunch? And, um, and Isis is really not that much bigger. But anyway, it was per it's perfect because if I needed to hold it this way, then I would have to have it that small, especially for my little hands. So I did that. And I felt energy from it, not hugely, but I definitely felt something. And so for a while, I don't know, 30 minutes or so, that's the way I just lay there in bed with my right hand lying on my back holding the crystal like that, crystal skull. And so then a little, I started getting sleepy, thank God. So I turned on, I felt it was okay to turn on my side. At that point, they said, well, take your fingers out of the sockets and put them on the point of the chin. So I did that. And I just sort of rested my hand that way. And I went to sleep. And that was the end of that. So um, I can't tell you what all of this means at this moment. But it is very powerful. It, and I feel that major things are going on here. And on various levels, you know, different levels. Now, I know that Chaco Canyon was something that I received information on. Now, I have been, wait, let me interrupt myself here. I've been to Chaco Canyon. Simeon and I went when we lived in Crestone before, so it would have been the 1990s, you know, probably 96, 97, something like that. We went to Chaco Canyon, and it was an incredible experience, and I had interesting things happen, but I didn't see any czar crystals or anything like that. But in the 1980s, I received information about Chaco Canyon. Again, no czar crystals involved, but about it being so special and very active on the inner planes. Well, 
Well, I, thanks to Evernote, I was able to look up Chaco Canyon in my previous material. And this is from, um, oh gosh, I thought I had it right in front of me now, but I don't see it. It's from, yeah, it's from 1986. Issue 4 of 1986. And get a load of this. So I, I really need to read this to you because it's just all falling together. Superimposed in another dimension over the ruins of the Grand Kiva in Chaco Canyon, New Mexico, is a much larger kiva, one resplendent in its sacred power, undefiled by mankind. Now, I got to pause and say what I was seeing, one with the top, one without, and you know, just different things. I was probably seeing one flash in and out from the one that's down there and the one that's above it, you know? I'm thinking the one that's above it is the one that has the top. So it continues, its shape is the representation of the infinity mandala also seen in the Stargate Circle Pattern, issue 286. Well, I don't have that handy right now. This interdimensional kiva is also integrated, <coughs> excuse me, integrated, as is the infinity mandala with Ezekiel's wheel. The inner plane kiva, which has only recently manifested over the ruins in Chaco Canyon at Pueblo Bonito, is the it is stanza, I-L-L-S-T-A-N-Z-A, or perfect form. The stanza is represented by the thousand-petal lotus, and thus the kiva's interior divisions are a thousand chambers. Most of these thousand chambers are very small, resounding enclosures, which serve the purpose of capturing all sound given off within the kiva and producing a harmonic vibration like the inside of a giant wind instrument. The opening to the kiva bears a sculpted ram's head above the door. There are four major doorways inside the first, totaling five doors or paths. The first door all initiates must enter in order to pass through the other four. Once the path of the ram has been taken, it is up to the initiate to know which of the other four paths he must embark upon at this time. Each initiate knows that eventually he must experience all five paths. As revealed in Ezekiel's vision, the four paths after the fifth are designated by the archetypes of the lion, the bull, the eagle, and the man. Within the center earth, Central Earth is raised the Ilistanza Kiva in physical form, duplicating its counterpart on the inner plane. Among the 12 sacred tribes of the Central Earth domain, this Kiva is the essential activator of the perfect form realization. Now think with perfect form realization. Think of the pure gem. Now the pure gem hadn't been introduced to me at this time when I wrote this in 1986 or whatever. But um, Think about that, because that's what it's really talking about here. Um, so where I lost my place now. Boy, did I lose my place. Let's see, where is it? Ah, uh, become. I read that. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll just start here. Among the 12 sacred tribes of the central earth domain, this kiva is essential activator of the perfect form realization within those initiates of the medicine wheel who are to become masters of power service to the planet. Now, I got to stop again, so I'm going to put my finger here so I won't lose it. What did I say about the feeling? I saw, I saw Katrina and Jennifer and or Andrea and I around this czar crystal in the kiva, which kiva doesn't matter, they're all kind of conjoined here. And um, 
the rest of the show are around that. And I was saying that I was being told that the teaching circle, as I'm calling it, um, would was for a greater purpose even than what it is on the outer. And that is to bring people into this state of being so that they can disseminate it to others. And here I'm reading the same thing in other words, because it's saying, Among the 12 sacred tribes of the central earth domain, this Kiva is the essential activator of the perfect form realization within those initiates of the medicine wheel who are to become masters of power service to the planet. It seems like it's saying the same thing, at least to me it does. No ordained shaman, priest, science master, or adept of any of the knowledge arts can be granted entrance into the power field before first receiving the realization of his own perfect form. This is called the zero moon or perfect or vision perfect. It is achieved by entering the Ilistanza Kiva, which is more than a symbolic representation, but is a vibratory furnace or amplitude grid for awakening the crown chakra of the body. This, the most sacred of light centers, in the body is the portal to the perfect form or fulfillment of divine perfection that is our true reality beyond the gates of past, present, and future. After the initiate has entered each of the four doors or gates behind the ram's gate, he is presented with three further entrances, these being the trinity of the Godhead. Once past these doors, he finds himself surrounded with the song of the vision perfect humming through the sacred Kiva. This intoning hum is created in the thousand chambers of the Kiva as the initiate spirit being, pausing here for a turn page, becomes awakened to his own life song. It is unifying of all melody of the earth. It is the sounding of the humpback whales who play Earth's dream song through their fluted bodies. It is the music of the last of the, of the species, the splashing of rose petals falling into a hidden pool, and a mockingbird's laughter. And I might also add, is the humming of bees. And if you recall, Katrina's uh, dweller skull connection has to do with the humming of bees and the chambers at uh, Zimbabwe. So, you know, and it's all kind of fitting together here. This song captures the songs unheard by the sounds unheard by the human ear, the heavenly choirs, choir of stars, as their sensitive rays strike the hollow earth's bell, like a mantle, nature davis in a mountain valley, all breath breaths of life are set to the music of the initiate soul. As he walks through the grand lotus, the perfect form emerges in his realization of self. The Listanza Kiva is a recreation of the engramic stimuli within the brain that unlocks soul-spirit transcendence. Understand that this is not an artificial stimulus, but a natural attuning device that merely releases the blocks within the individual which keeps him from perceiving him herself. Should one not be ready to see perfection within, the kiva would be no more than stone to him, and the great sounding of life, the song of songs, would be largely unheard by his ears. What he did hear would be disharmony, for it would be his own clutter, cluttered illusion transported to him in sound. Thus, it is only that single person who may either be opened into the lotus or remain closed to the sun, regardless of the Elistanza or any device, even one of a divine nature. The gateways of the Trinity are within the logos of the fish of Pisces. This includes the cetaceans and is represented by the Bible as the whale of Jonah. The goat of Capricorn and the crab of Cancer However, the logos containing the emblematic emblem of a mantric frequency charge of these stations will change and indeed has changed through time. The Elistanza is in fact 
change itself, embodied in an instrument of nature and man. Just as the fragile lotus flower is in transit from life to death and beyond, so is the human element. Only the spiritual identity of perfect form remains the same, and even this must be perceived from a moving train of quantum dynamics within the soul's patterning. That is, until the man-woman embodied spirit cuts the cord of karma and sails past the golden ram's gate into the sea of perfect form. Here all illusion is transparent and holds to nothing but its own mask. The stars of mind are stoked by the archangels in a fiery furnace of spirit, and the soul is torn from the dragon's heart to become a lamb at the feet of the shepherd. Oh my gosh. I'm reading this as if the first time. I just kind of am overwhelmed by it. The principle of the Elistanza is represented in Parsifal by Wolfram, Wolfram von Eisenberg, oh, <laughs> Eisenbach, the as the city called Petlamun. Petlamun. Let me get this right. P e t a l a m u n d. Petlamun. Petal Mound. This is elaborated upon in Trevor Ravenscroft's The Cup of Destiny. To quote from Ravenscroft's text, and I'm quoting here, it is the 16-petal lotus flower which Wolfram is describing. And it is, the and it is this very organ of the crown chakra represented by the lotus, which gives an insight into the workings of the law of destiny, karma. Now that's the end of the quote. And I'm saying now, while Petlamun was the embodiment of the 16-petal lotus, Elistanza is the continuation of the eightfold path to the 1,000th power, which in light mathematics corresponds to the infinity decimal of the grand mandala of the inf infinite, excerpted from issue 4, 1986 of the source. Wow. I'm going to take this information. I'm going to put it into a um, into the uh, notes section of the Sholar. So you will find it posted in the notes section, or it will come up on the front page. Also, the Sholar. I'll pin it there. Um, I'm kind of blown away with it all, so I don't even know where to go from here. But let me see if there's anything else before I continue. I was going to make this short, mind you, but obviously this is not short. Well, what we're looking at here is from um, Spirit Mythos. And it is about my what I received very briefly from my journey. And actually it was in May of 2002 that we went there, which means we would have been living by then in Santa Fe rather than Crestone. So I'm going to read this briefly because even though it's not talking about the Lestanza, it's talking about the actual people that lived at Chaco Canyon, the first people, and um, because it's been inhabited quite a few times over. So it does connect though. So I'm gonna read it briefly here. The following are my Akashic insights concerning the ancient purpose of the buildings constructed in Chaco Canyon and into an even larger region encompassing the canyon between 850 to 1250 AD. I feel that I have been greatly aided in my assessment in, of this Akashic record by a guardian of the Chaco temples, a man now in spirit who identifies himself as Achua. To begin with, Guardians, priests, priestesses of Chaco were called Kanti, meaning the prescribed ones, those who offered themselves and were thus were given prescription to act, to hold a point of entry into the spirit world. Chaco Canyon was called by the Kanti place of the singing spirits. The Kanti serve spirit and the place of the spirit, the spirit of the place of the singing spirits served the earth. Gosh, that's kind of confusing. Let me read that again. The Kanti served spirit and the spirit of the place of the singing spirits served the earth souls who opened themselves in awareness and ritual to the serving were known simply as the people whomever came into the temples and participated in the rituals and ceremonies of the place of the singing spirits were to be counted among the people 
The temples of the place of the singing spirit were intended to be instruments of the gods. They were tuned to the harmonies of the universe. Each temple was built to be played by the frequencies of the earth, wind, and cosmos, quickened by human voice and instrumentation. The small dark rooms within the temples were built according to the sacred geometry of the music of the spheres in resonance with the earth. They were resonating cavities. Some of the rooms were sealed off where whenever it was decided that a new harmony was to be created, just as one would hold down a string on a violin at a certain place to change the vibration along the line of that string. The sounds of the temple instruments themselves could not be heard within the range of normal human hearing, although some animals can hear at that frequency. However, many human voices were raised in specific psalming to quicken the temples into their own refrains. The people who gathered for this purpose were not only trained to perform these symphonic rites, but were able to hear in varying degrees the reply from the Templaric instrumentation. This reminds me of when we were in the Pyramid of Giza in the King's Chamber uh, doing our resonating frequencies. This was in 1997. And as we built that resonation, we started hearing replies. All of us heard them, so much so that the tour guide ran out of the, the Egyptian tour guide ran out of the chamber way off and sat by the tour bus and wouldn't come back in. So anyway, that reminds me of that. To continue, understand that all planetary bodies and suns emit frequencies which are a form of natural music, and so does the earth. She sings not only through her winds and waters, but through the rocks as the sun, moon, and starlight strikes them, and as the cold and heat expand and contract them. There is also the sound coming deep from the center of the earth, which animals can hear, that permeates the whole planet. All these sounds come together coming together, create a symphony of sound that is glorious to those who are able to discern it. While humans do not ordinarily have the hearing range to listen to this greater song, individuals can receive spiritual training to open the centers of their brains to be receptive to these frequencies, creating neural pathways that pick up the planetary vibrations and transform them into sound responses within the cortex. In conducting and performing these human earth stellar symphonies, the ancients of Chaco Canyon were able to control certain aspects of the natural world around them, calling these desired conditions into creation. They also sent their astral bodies to various locations on the planet and inside the earth and indeed into other star systems. They had elaborate rituals that expressed what they experienced there in these other realms. It is true that few actually lived in the place of the singing spirit. There were only the Conti, guardians and priests and priestesses who lived in this sacred place, along with the few who served them in the needs of everyday survival. However, large gatherings of the people came together in the musical temples there for the purpose of performing events which altered their reality and the earth's imprint in space and time. Guided by the priests and priestesses, the people created holograms of intricate style and complex complexity in which to live their incarnative experience. Yet these complex systems did not last. When it was decided by the guardians that the time at hand for a sacred closure of the entire temple complex, the power enve envelopes around the temples which were generated within the kivas were collapsed by setting great fires within the kivas. They then sealed key doors of the temples so that they could no longer sing with the earth and the stars. After the structures were sealed away, the priests and priestesses left and the people returned no more. Yet the guardians remained. These souls chose to remove themselves from earthly life at that point and continue to guardian the sealed temples and the land of the place of the singing spirits from the vantage point of the astral plane. One of these guardians is Achua, who came to me in spirit during my visit to Chaco Canyon in May of 2002. The sacred power and energy of the temples was not destroyed with the dismantling of the form. 
once sacred closure was put into place, the energy remained to go through its cycle and be absorbed into the earth to a rising within the people in a new form. Only the mechanics of that power was disassembled. Now, the stanza is a higher frequency presentation of all that was built there and achieved there and brought into this higher form. And apparently, as I read from the information from 1986, at that time, it was recently presented, brought into creational presence above the kivas at that time. So we have two things going on here, but they're related, totally related. And um, so I wanted to read this as well. And so, in conclusion, at least for the time being, we see a lot of things coming together here. So it's telling me that the Chaco Canyon entrance into this estanza in connection to the Tsar Octahedron crystal and all of that is now positioned as a portal through this arrangement of the sacred on and the um, the area under Mount Blanc, uh, Mount Blanc and the sand dunes. So that actually the, the table, the Rastaru table uh, is the one that's literally connecting, overlaying the, um, the Tsar crystal that allows the Elistans and all of that to interface. So it hasn't been moved here. It's still where it was, etherically. But we have a connection here, a direct passage, a direct link, and not only that, an interface with the whole system that is developing and building here in the Creston San Luis Valley. Obviously, there's much more to come with all of this. But I believe that I'm ready to conclude this. I'm just going to check with Thoth for a moment. Well, in conclusion, Thoth is just saying, be mindful that um, we have these many, these different and yet connected energy frequencies coming together through certain groups. We have the Sholar it has a very strong presence here. It's basically the hub of the whole Sholar experience in a location, physical location situation, with of course all of the Sholar all over the planet, but you know its hub is here in Crestone with the sacred on and all of this frequency. And then we have the Templars, the hub for that energetically, although as it builds, it's going to be there's going to be locations in different places on the planet. The hub, the frequency hub, is here. And now we're also having this uh, sacred teaching circle that um, Katrina and Jennifer and Andrea have created and I'm entering into. And although they're not physically located here, energetically, this aspect of it that is the deeper aspect that connects to the um, receiving of the uh, the encoding or the codes coming out of the Elistanza and the whole initiatory passage that it represents. That part of it is, again, located here in this area. So he wanted me to just overview that for you because these collections are all their own systems, but they're strongly interrelated and they share um, a greater field that is of the, the sacred on. And so that is it for now, my dears, and we will see where this takes us. <laughs>